This is Karen Weber, Managing Editor of American Magazine. Uh, I'm here today talking with Sam Sawyer, a Jesuit in formation and an associate editor at the Jesuit Post. Thank you for joining us, Sam. Hi, Carrie. It's good to be here. Uh, as you know, uh, your article about Apple and whether or not uh, Apple is sort of a kind of technological religion uh, is appearing in our upcoming issue, along with a review of Jobs, the new movie about Steve Jobs. Uh, and our readers will probably have noticed uh, that the two articles take a slightly different take on sort of the value of what Apple has offered to society, what Steve Jobs has contributed, uh, the importance of design. So I wonder if maybe we could start out with um, some of your the ways in which you think your thoughts um, on the value of Steve Jobs' work, on the value of Apple and design might differ from the other article. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that the review uh, looks at, and I didn't really go into so much, are sort of the, the personal qualities and the, the kind of interpersonal relationships the jobs forged. And certainly, I mean, I think there are a lot of interesting questions there uh, from the book and, and from the movie. But uh, one of the things that um, I think where there is a little bit of difference is tweet, treating design as a question more of marketing or as a question more of uh, something more fundamental. And I think one of the insights that, that Apple's had and that Apple has encouraged in me as well is that design, uh, well this is a, a line actually from Jobs himself, that design isn't just about how it looks, design is about how it works. Um, and I think really one of the things Apple's done with technology um, and then encouraged uh, as the rest of the world tries to catch up and compete with Apple here is humanizing technology. So both making technology more useful, but also quite simply making technology more beautiful, more enjoyable and comfortable, you know, so that it matters that, um, you know, back in the days of the old, like, candy-colored plastic iMacs, you know, that, that they were attractive and you wanted to put one, you know, like, in your living room. Um, it matters that an iPhone feels really good to hold in the hand, um, and it's, it's kind of attractive that way. And before we dismiss that as just marketing, I think that, you know, when you think about what a big role technology plays in the world, how much space it takes up in human lives, um, it's important that there's a way to make it beautiful. Uh, I might suggest you, in the same way that there's, important, there's an importance in the fact that we can make something like a bridge beautiful, right? It has a fully utilitarian purpose, you know, it needs to carry things from one side of the river to the other. But they're also, like, we, we go overboard, we spend a lot of money trying to make bridges that are beautiful because they're such a fundamental feature of our landscape. Um, and I think there's something important there about technology as well. It's a, it's a fundamental feature of the contemporary world. It's a good thing that someone's out there trying to make it beautiful. That makes a lot of sense. Now, do you think in uh, humanizing the technology that the way that we sort of as humans have adapted this technology and adapted our behavior to having this technology, that there is a potential for dehumanizing ourselves. Oh, sure. Yeah. And this is something I, I mentioned in the review as well, that I think there's, you know, um, that the kind of products that Apple gives us uh, certainly encourage, um, they encourage a greater desire for beauty. They make us um, probably impatient and less satisfied with technology that's clunky and unbeautiful, I think that might largely be a good thing. Um, but they also encourage this sense of, like, desires should be easily satisfiable, right? Like, nothing should ever be farther away than a tap on an iPhone screen or than, you know, two clicks in a web browser or something like that. Um, and I think, yeah, I think there probably is a tension there um, between, you know, what's deeply human but requires more effort and the kind of... Uh, effortlessness that Apple wants to achieve in all its projects. Like, it just works. Um, well, that's that's great, but uh, it just works is not going to be an answer to, to some of the deeper needs um, in human nature. And so I think, yeah, there is a question there about uh, how much do we get attached, how much do we get shaped by the expectation of everything being immediately available and automatic. Right. I think it's interesting how well, and this is something that you point out, how well Apple lends itself to religious terminology and religious imagery, that it has created this kind of um, structure and almost a culture uh, that is, uh, just surrounds their products, and that you sort of have to buy into if you really want to use their products in the best way possible, in a sense. Yeah, I think actually one of the 
what are the features of religious experience that Apple sort of uh, captures or or you know models well in, in technological life is the experience of insight, right? Like once you get it, then you're drawn deeper in, and other things become possible. I talk about this in my piece as kind of a version of of dogma, right? Like once you've accepted the Apple way of doing it, other things start to become possible that weren't possible before. Um, you have a different kind of relationship with technology, and the technology enables you to do different things. The same way for a believer, well, not the same way, but a similar way for a believer that w once you, you know, accept the fundamental uh, insights of the religion, you can start to see other possibilities that you can't reach from the outside. Right. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, to put it in very sort of stark marketing terms, you know, there's so much that we're going to buy into what we call the Apple ecosystem, right? Like now everything is going to be an iCloud and all my media is going to be going to come from iTunes and I'm going to have this whole set of apps that works on my iPhone and my iPad but not on Android. And, um, and there is a kind of, uh, there's a choice involved in that, but it's a choice that also comes with, with possibilities if you're willing to go there. Um, it constrains some possibilities, but it opens up others uh, because you're able to use technology uh, in a new way, and in a way that doesn't that doesn't require you to do as much heavy lifting, as much reconfiguring and thinking about it all the time. It just becomes there as a possibility, as a new capacity in your life. Right. It's sort of this strange technological version of faith that where it works best when you're all in. When you said, this is it, exactly. I've devoted my life to this, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, right. it's I've, I've all, my over, technological... all my technological details. Yeah, exactly. You have my credit card. You have. I have the iPhone. Well, I may as well get the iPad. I may as well use the MacBook because once you have all those things, they work easily together as opposed to trying to transfer things from one to the other. Right, and quite honestly, I mean, you could. It'd be possible to write a similar sort of article about buying into the Google ecosystem. Yes. Uh, even though that one is a little bit more open, a little bit more less, you know, polished around the edges sometimes. But Google very much wants the same thing, and I mean. We, we shouldn't be sort of overly sanguine about this because, you know, certainly in Google's case, the interest is so that they can sell our eyeballs to advertisers. That's how Google makes money. Right. And in Apple's case, the interest is so that they can sell us new pricey Apple hardware every year or two years when they come out with the next model. And, you know, we need to recognize that. But, but it's not an exchange that's absent value for the user, right? Like there is, it's just a question of, you know, what kind of value do we assign it and how much do we want to, uh, what parts of ourselves do we want to hand over to that kind of technological mediation? Right, right. And how do you think um, we should go about today trying to find the best balance between that, between saying, you know what, I'm really glad that these products work really well together and that's useful to me, and I have now become tied to these things, dependent on them, um, or, you know, they interrupt your social interactions with actual people. Yeah, well, I think, you know, so ask a Jesuit, you're going to get a recommendation for Ignatian spirituality and probably the examine. Uh, so the question I ask myself um, in, my, in my daily examine when I go to look at this is, is, is my use of technology actually, is it actually humanizing, right? Is it deepening relationships or is it making them more superficial? Is it making me more attentive to other people or is it making me more attentive just to my phone? Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's a question that, that the pendulum swings back and forth on, um, and that we have to pay attention to. But I certainly know, you know, there are like things like um, the ease of um, FaceTime, you know, video calls via Apple, uh, has kept me in better touch with friends. Um, it's you know, it means I can watch, I can easily watch my two-year-old nephew um, and, and and have chats with him uh, while he sits on my my brother's lap, and you know that's profoundly humanizing. And so I think um, you know, those are things that we don't need to be skeptical of, but I do need to ask the question, are those the primary thing that's happening, or am I primarily getting sucked into, oh, what are the last 12 things on Twitter because they're streaming across the screen of my phone? Right, right. That makes sense. Um, do you, have you found any apps or that are religious or Catholic or scriptural based that you found to be useful and sort of trying to uh, bring some of the faith element into the technological element? Well, um, I mean, some things just kind of sheer practicality, like um, I have a 
well, a couple different apps actually that uh, give me the option to for the liturgy of the hours, so the, the regular daily prayer of the church. So instead of having to drag around, you know, a book that's like that thick, and I'll make sure that's with me. It's on my phone. It's instantly accessible. It means I can I can pray uh, the liturgy of the hours like while I'm you know on a subway train or something like that. Um, and that's so that's helpful just to the practice of a regular devotional life. Um, I also think there's uh, so there's some good things like I pray as you go. Um, and, I can't remember now if it's an app or a mobile website, but I mean, there's there's stuff like that that's accessible um, and and useful in that way. Um, but honestly, the more important part for me has been uh, the way it's facilitated uh, the relationships that are important to my spiritual life and my religious life. So it's allowed me to have a kind of um, tight, uh, interactive contact both with um, friends uh, within the Jesuits and also friends outside the Jesuits. Uh, People with whom I am, even if it's over iMessage or something, you know, people with whom I'm, I, I live my spiritual life in conversation with those people, um, and it's been really good that uh, that communication has become so much easier with them. I think that's a a, a tightness of conversation, a, a regular a regularity of conversation that I certainly didn't have, you know, ten years ago, probably not even five years ago. And what role do you see the Jesuit post um, playing in sort of uh, the t sort of world of technology and religion um, as we move forward? I would say uh, this idea of you know humanizing technology is something that I think uh, we see the Jesuit post attempting to do. So particularly in the field of social media and social networks, to be a presence uh, in those areas that is both you know fully human, so engaged and attentive and, you know, responding to people as people, paying attention to their experience and dealing with real human experience, but also saying, you know, like, real human experience includes religious and spiritual experience. It includes the experience of faith that's open to the experience of communion and community that we find in the church. Um, and in that way, you know, so to take the, the great gift that we've been given in technology, that really is a significant human achievement. Um, but to say, you know, like, this significant human achievement ought to be open to things that are, that are bigger than, you know, like, the latest kid in video on YouTube, right? As, as wonderful as kid in videos on YouTube are, that there might be possibilities for this that go further. Um, and those possibilities don't just include news and politics and, you know, celebrity culture, but if they're going to be truly human, they also have to include spirituality. They have to include faith. Very good. Well, best of luck in all of your work at the Jesuit Post, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks a lot. Take care, Carrie.